Beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains' majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved and mercy more than. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness, and every gain divine. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Good morning. My name is Janice Tuck, and I serve as Secretary of the Board of Trustees of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spartanburg this year. I have been a member of this church since 2002. I brought my boys up here. This is our home. I live in Lyman with my husband, Robert, who is also a member. Thank you for joining us via live stream this morning. In cooperation with global and national health authorities, we have suspended all in-person church activities for the time being. Our care for one another and for our community only becomes more important in times like these. I encourage you to visit our website, www.uucs.org, for ways you can help in our work. If you have questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to me, any of our board members, or any member of our staff. Our job is to serve you. We are glad you have taken time to connect with us this morning. Especially in the times like these, we need each other. Thank you for being part of our congregation today. We are a people of faith and hope. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Robin Carter, your guest speaker this morning, while our minister, Scott Neely, is taking a much needed sabbatical. And as I look out at these empty chairs, I miss you guys so much. So I'm going to close my eyes and imagine that you're here with me this morning. Maybe you can close your eyes with me and remember sort of who normally sits around you on a Sunday morning. And I'm just gonna say hello to all you guys, even you goobers that usually sit on the back. It is so good to know that you are here with me, even though we are apart. I am honored to kick off our July series on UU Women Heroes. We are doing a bit of looking back, looking forward this month as Ruth Stanton, Mary Underwood, Stacy Jackson, and I are telling the stories of pivotal UU women from the perspective of our own career points, education, nursing, social work, and healing. As a public school teacher and community college instructor since 2001, my perspective, of course, is one of educator. This morning, we will meet the Peabody Sisters, 
Pioneers in Public Education. If you were an avid reader in the 1950s, you may have read a very popular book about these three sisters, Elizabeth, Mary, and Sophia. The Peabody Sisters of Salem told a palatable version of these women, and they were portrayed as sort of a quaint trio a la Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. And the author boiled these women's identity down to a single word description. Elizabeth, the brain, Mary, the beauty, and Sophia, the invalid, author's word, not mine. But that version of these women is simply incomplete and woefully inadequate. So I'm going to attempt to paint a more complete picture this morning. So welcome. I'm delighted to tell the story of these powerhouse women who overcame poverty and changed the very face of public education in America along the way. I'm pretty pumped to look back at their story, and then we will look forward to what I feel is a modern day lesson their lives can teach us all. I'm so glad to have you take this journey with me. Good morning. I'm Laura Rose, and I'll be your worship associate for today. Children are to be guided to make a beginning in all the arts and sciences without interference with their spontaneity, the instinct of imitation being so used as to give them without constraining them. Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, American educator and writer. must have a code that you can live by and so become yourself because the past is just a goodbye teach your children well their father's hell did slowly go by and feed them on your dreams the one they picks the one you'll know by don't you ever ask them why if they told you you would cry so just look at them and sigh and know they love you can you hear of ten can know the fears that your elders grew by, and so please help them with your you believe They seek the truth before they can die. And teach your parents well. The children's hell will slowly go by and feed them on your dreams, the one they picks, the one you'll know by. Don't you ever ask them why, if they told you you would cry, so just look at them and sigh, and know they love you. I just have to say, I hope that is as beautiful online as it is in person, just very good. Our covenant written by this congregation provides the practical guidance of how we live together in community. It serves as our promise to ourselves and others. Let us join our voices and speak the truth of our covenant now together. We are a people of faith and hope. Together we covenant to strive to become our better selves, to honor both the critical mind and the generous heart, to prove that diversity need not mean divisiveness, 
and to respond to systems of violence and oppression with the power of a love beyond belief. This is the time in our live service when we would share joys and concerns by visiting our rippling bowl. We hold one another in care. Share what is in your heart silently with your community now and know that here your joys and concerns are held by us all. We also use this time to greet one another. The joy we share has not been dampened by our separation. Take a moment to send your care to others, perhaps by a text, or just a thought of those in our community. Feel our care for one another. Let us now just share in a moment of silence and reflect. We bring our gifts. Please visit our website at www.uucs.org. Below this live stream, you will see a button that says help. This page is updated weekly and contains numerous ways that you can share your gifts from action to letter writing to litter pickup to your financial donation. Give to the church, give to one of the many funds we support, or give to our Share the Plate recipient. This month, we share the plate with Safe Homes Rape Crisis Center. Safe Homes provides help to victims of domestic violence and victims of sexual assault in Spartanburg and Cherokee counties. UUCS is a longtime supporter of Safe Homes. Church members, including Betty Coyster, have volunteered here. Betty says, quote, I found out about Safe Homes in 1989 and soon trained as a crisis line volunteer. That meant answering calls at night or on weekends. Safe Homes has a domestic shelter and much more, including counseling for sexual and physical abuse and help contacting legal aid and other community services. I have been there 30 years and have seen many people pass through. It is a wonderful experience to help them. We can always use new volunteers. If you're interested, I'll be glad to talk to you. Just give me a phone call. So just give Betty a call if you'd like to volunteer. 
Most recently, our sewing circle has donated cloth face masks to them so they can ensure that everyone who enters their building, and especially the thrift store, is wearing a mask. For the first two Sundays of July, half the undesignated funds from the collection and all of any gifts designated safe homes or share the plate will go to support Safe Homes Rape Crisis Center. The Peabody Sisters. Let's begin with the end. These three women changed the face of public education. Relatively unknown in the history books, Elizabeth, Mary, and Sophia, the Peabody Sisters, are ascribed as champions of reform movements, pioneers in mod modern educational theory, founders of the kindergarten movement in America, and supporters of the arts. These sisters were contemporaries of several famous men whose names we all know well. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Horace Mann, who marries Mary, William Ellery Channing, Theodore Parker, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who marries Sophia. But who are the Peabody sisters? Well, let's start with their accomplishments. Elizabeth Peabody, the aforementioned brain of the sisters, the eldest, was an American educator who opened the first English language kindergarten in the United States. She began teaching at age 13. She is the author and translator of more than a dozen books, the founder of her own magazine, an editor and publisher of many works of great 19th century philosophers and politicians. Mary Peabody, the beauty, the middle sister, taught French, German, and Latin by day, and wrote textbooks on grammar, geography, and botany in her spare time. Her most popular book, The Flower People, was a children's horticultural guide published by none other than her big sister Elizabeth. Mary was instrumental in translating many German tales published by Elizabeth as well. Sophia Peabody, the invalid according to that 1950s book, suffered from debilitating migraines and other ailments, further exacerbated by the outdated and medically damaging treatments at that time. But she really should be known as the artist. She was one of just a handful of women artists in New England whose work was shown or sold with any regularity. Sophia taught alongside her sisters in the schools that Elizabeth and Mary founded together and was often the illustrator for many books published by Elizabeth. But as any good teacher would tell you, it's not the accomplishments, it's not the end results that matter. That's focusing on the wrong thing. It's the journey that counts. Don't applaud the A on the paper or the math test. The growth mindset that educators and parents really should encourage isn't focused on the end point. It's the effort, it's the self-discipline, it's the learning and sometimes failing the entire process that it took to get to the end point that I cheer for as a teacher. So instead, let's focus on how they got to where they did. Let me say from the outset that I am certain I will fail miserably at capturing their greatness. So I'm enlisting the help of our worship associate, Laura Rose, this morning. She'll be sharing with us brief excerpts from the more comprehensive, more comprehensive book, 2005's Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism, which took author Megan Marshall more than two decades to compile and write. So, 
when you see Laura Rose come and take the mic and you think for the briefest moments, is it over? Is Robin done talking? Well, you guys know the answer to that question. The answer is no. I'll be back for more. But Laura Rose will help me this morning with three readings during the meditation, one about each sister. So these sisters and their entire family are just fascinating. In the 1840s, the Wednesday night open houses at the Peabody home on Boston's West Street drew a glittering crowd of thinkers, writers, social reformers, and religious leaders. The Peabody bookstore and lending library became a center of Boston intellectual life. So just how did these women become such champions of educational theory and pivotal leaders in reform movements in the early 1800s? Well, I believe the kernel of their story begins where most of our stories do, with their mom, Eliza Peabody. The matriarch of this family is Eliza Peabody, born in 1778 in Middlesex County, Massachusetts. Eliza was the daughter of highly educated and politically connected Joseph Pierce Palmer. Her father's claim to fame was that of a 1773 Boston Tea Party participant, as in he was one of the guys that dressed up as a Native American and literally threw the barrels of tea overboard. He claimed later he was only making a little saltwater tea. Their family later lost everything in a series of tragic events related to their protest of British rule that undermined the reputation of the family. So Eliza grew up very poor, though well-connected. Despite moving every few years to smaller and smaller homes, being doled out to family to live with, having to help raise younger siblings, cousins, etc., at such a young age, Eliza became a powerhouse in her own right. Eliza's early untrained literary and teaching abilities earned her a reputation as a walking dictionary as a young woman, a title that she really loathed as a child, but she published at least seven poems by the age of 22. Her most famous poem, A True Lady, called for women to reject the low standards for female behavior that men held for them and instead aspire to honesty, intelligence, and virtue. She was an early and vocal champion for the intellectual and spiritual dignity of women. So is it, is it, is it any wonder that Eliza raised her three daughters to be strong women. Eliza wholeheartedly believed that the fate of our country is in some degree dependent on the education of its females. She also knew the importance of being able to financially support herself as she didn't want to struggle as her own family had. What drove Eliza? In one word, poverty. There were very few options for women in the early 1800s, and there's an understatement for you. So Eliza, who spent her youth watching her family navigate bankruptcy and debtor's prison, knew her escape would inevitably come through matrimony. The problem is, the man she pursued was a haphazard man who was constantly getting the young family involved in get-rich-quick schemes that never materialized. He garnered very little respect from his own children, so Eliza was the de facto head of household as the mother to seven total children. The family never really got things together and struggled with poverty and debt for decades to come. It was poverty that shaped Eliza's approach to motherhood and resulted in the Peabody sisters being better educated than their brothers. While public schools weren't great, Eliza could afford to send, excuse me, couldn't afford to send the three younger brothers to private schools, but it was only the boys who were eligible to attend Salem public schools. 
The girls couldn't, as there would be no higher education option for women for another half century. So Eliza taught her three daughters in her homeschool for girls, where it wasn't an option for the boys to be. And so the girls ended up being more highly educated than their brothers. Eliza's teaching style included a stimulating mix of dramatic readings, lively conversation, and inventive writing exercises. Students read from several female authors. Elizabeth, the oldest daughter, remembers growing up as a young girl in her mother's homeschool where she was never made to feel that intelligence conflicted with femininity. The sisters were raised seeing women as prominent intellectuals, so much so that Elizabeth was shocked as an older child to learn that men had actually been involved in the founding of America. We'll pause here and meet Elizabeth. Hear now the words of Meghan Marshall. Elizabeth was slim and small, fair and blue-eyed, pretty in all the standard ways. And she had magnetism, the aura of intellectual and spiritual vitality. Yet there was something off-putting about Elizabeth to a young man. Once her eyes were raised to meet his, her manner could be so forthright that he might instantly forget what had drawn him to her in the first place. Face to face with her demanding intelligence, Elizabeth looks suddenly seemed beside the point. Hers was an attractive force not easily reckoned with, even by men whose ideas on other matters were less than conventional. Men could and did fall in love with Elizabeth, but whether they would stay in love and whether Elizabeth wanted them to were quite different questions. Meghan Marshall. Elizabeth was a feminist before feminism was even a thing. I said before that she was shocked to learn that men were actually a part of the founding of America. I and you learned about historical founding fathers, but Elizabeth learned the ancestors deserved the credit. Ancestors, ancestors. How peculiar, she thought. These women all had the same name, Anne. In Elizabeth's mind, these holy women were in white robes streaming along from their boat onto Plymouth Rock. What an upbringing these girls must have had where Elizabeth never even questioned that all of American history was largely women-led. Elizabeth was a legitimate scholar by the age of 13. She engaged in religious debates with the likes of William Ellery Channing, a first-generation American liberal UU minister whose Baltimore sermon became the most widely published piece of literature in America for over a decade and eventually led to the end of the Calvinist hold on the Massachusetts churches. Channing taught at the theological school at Harvard and Elizabeth followed a good portion of the study that he had his graduate students in divinity completing. She again was 13 at the time. She became a teacher herself. Her own experience shaped the way she viewed education. At age 22, Elizabeth declared the whole theory of education was essentially defective because old people hardly ever knew how young people felt. And she vowed to keep in remembrance how, when she grew up, she would inform the world, perhaps to lay out a better system. But Elizabeth didn't do this alone. She had her sister Mary, who was pivotal in Elizabeth's founding of several schools for girls in Massachusetts. Let's meet her now. Again, words from Meghan Marshall. Mary Peabody lacked the intense theological focus of her older sister, yet she was also a voracious reader, 
chiefly of fiction, she had heard her mother complain that her pupils' minds were weakened by light reading, but Mary felt instinctively that the popular novels she cherished provided a key to her future every bit as useful as the Unitarian doctrinal works Elizabeth devoured. As she read, Mary drew inspiration for her own break from poverty, which she sensed would come in a different way from Elizabeth's. Reading insulated Mary from the uncertainty of daily life in the Peabody household and allowed her to withdraw from competition with her brilliant older sister and delicate younger one. In delicious moments of reverie, Mary retreated to an imaginary world. She later wrote where, quote, I am always my own heroine. I admire Mary so much. Her love of language was a huge motivator in her own educational experiences. After a spotty and unconventional education in her mother's and later Elizabeth's school, she enrolled in an uber-disciplined study of French that involved memorization, drills, recitations, verb conjugations, the works. She absolutely hated the cramming and the pressure, but was pleased to have learned a method for learning other languages so swiftly and efficiently. It was through that 18 months of intense French language learning that she said language was engraved upon her soul. She did vow, however, to find a way to teach her future students to love the very act of study because she really did not find enjoyment in the methods used by her own teacher. As a result of this experience, Mary was a different type of teacher than Elizabeth was. But the two complemented each other well, and they proceeded to open many schools for girls all over Massachusetts. Elizabeth and Mary moved to Boston in 1826, right as the city was growing more receptive to women of accomplishment. Their new school opened with a wait list and they began teaching older students and taking on protégés. Mary was only 19 and already a highly sought after teacher. In their school, intellectual equality had their female students learning Latin, though no woman could enter a profession like law or medicine that required the knowledge of the language. Several parents even questioned the point. They knew their daughters would never need to use Latin. It was too taxing, it was pointless, it wasn't required, etc. Mary continued teaching it though. Regardless of how the language was going to be used, certainly didn't mean women wouldn't benefit from the way classical languages strengthened the mind and supported the analytical approach to teaching other subjects. The sisters' approach was to let the students' innate curiosity drive the instruction. Elizabeth and Mary taught with the understanding that all great acquisitions come from voluntary thought. The problem was voluntary participation seemed to only drive Elizabeth's approach to her students not her sisters, as Sophia could certainly testify to. Let's hear now more words from Megan Marshall about the last sister of this trio. It had been nearly three years since Sophia had taken drawing lessons with Miss Davis in Salem, an interval spent more in her bed than at the drawing table. In Elizabeth's recollection of the moment, the usually voluble illustrator and drawing Master Francis Grater looked over Sophia's shoulder as she worked, offering no comment. When she had finished, Sophia looked up and asked, have you no word of criticism for me? 
Greater answered, I can only envy you. Sophia's work was always so perfect in each lesson that it looked like a model. She never made a false stroke. Yet, from the outset, Sophia herself saw drawing more than a craft to be mastered for later use in teaching. Art was a higher calling with a potential for self-expression. After six months, she was still working at landscapes and firmly attached to the process. I could not possibly express to you the intense delight I experience in every stroke of my pencil, Sophia wrote to her sisters in Boston. Quote, my soul steps forth upon the paper. Sophia was the free spirit of the three. She was the artist. She was also the youngest of the three sisters, so she was bossed around a lot, and she remained home with her mother for much longer than Elizabeth and Mary did. This was necessary on two fronts. First, their mother, Eliza, needed her help running her own school and raising three younger sons, and second, because Sophia suffered from debilitating health limitations that kept her in bed for long stretches of a time. Her innate abilities as an artist were forcefully encouraged by Elizabeth, who sacrificed even more to pay for Sophia's lessons. In the hopes that Sophia would become a great art teacher and therefore help pay down the family's debts with her profits. Sophia and Elizabeth fought extensively about this, as Sophia never really took to being an art instructor. But it was Sophia who largely financed much of the school's expenses through the sale of her artwork and was invaluable to both Elizabeth and Mary in terms of lending credibility and helping to establish an even stronger reputation of the Peabody sisters as serious educators. The twists and turns of their lives that fill this book will astonish you. There are just so many layers and so little time this morning. Collectively, their childhood and young adulthood included seasons of poverty, paying off their father's and later their brother's constant debts, depression, opium addiction, the death of two brothers in their prime, the loss of their infant baby sisters, and sometimes a very bitter sibling rivalry. Did I mention that Mary and Sophia both married men who had once been, uh, excuse me, once been beaux of Elizabeth? And yet, those experiences, the journey, not the accomplishments, that's what shape us. And so I find it so interesting that all of the experiences that the Peabody sisters, born mostly of necessity, is what allowed for and maybe even compelled each to make such a lasting impact on the world around them. Had they never needed to fight just to pay the bills, they likely would have spent their days reading and painting and doing needlework like so many other women of their day. They weren't setting out to be innovators or creators. They were largely just trying to survive. But as we've all heard before, crisis is the mother of innovation and creativity. I want to hone in on this concept of inno innovation and creativity being born of necessity. The Peabody sisters' innovation, creativity, boundary pushing, all of it, originated simply out of a need. It started with Eliza, their mom, and it continued for generations. The sisters knew that they needed to use their talents and abilities to escape the life of poverty that they teetered on the edge of for decades. They used the tools they had, but not just for their own betterment. 
they leverage their own talents and abilities to help themselves, their parents, and their brothers, but they did so with an outward view and focus on society as a whole. Of course, the idea of a crisis birthing something is not new. Public education finds itself in the midst of a pretty major crisis right now. And that was even before the pandemic. Recent stats tell us that in the US, high school dropouts are eight times more likely to be incarcerated. They are 50% less likely to vote, not eligible for up to 90% of the jobs and will learn less than half as much as college graduates. American students who are not reading at age, excuse me, at grade level by third grade are four times more likely to later drop out of school. Add poverty to the mix and a student is now 13 times less likely to graduate on time only 11 to 12% of Americans can read at an eighth grade level, whereas 14% of American population cannot read at all. Now, on top of all of that, throw in the pandemic. Children all over the US now have limited access, not only to in-person instruction, but we're seeing the internet divide exacerbate the issue of poverty since many homes simply cannot afford the high-speed internet services needed to continue with online education. And many rural areas don't even have the option. It's not just kids' education that's suffering, though. Basic nutritional needs are not being met, and physical safety is a major concern. It's estimated that over 30 million children in America receive free or reduced lunches at their public schools. And it's far too often the only hot meal kids have access to. Child abuse reporting has plummeted since schools have closed. But experts believe that it's not because there are fewer instances, it's just that teachers who are mandated reporters aren't seeing their kids with enough frequency to know what's going on. So we see cracks, even wider than before. But in a weird way, this is where I get even more passionate about fighting for change. I applaud the innovative ideas that are coming about as a solution to the crisis. Buses are delivering meals. Buses in school parking lots are now free Wi-Fi hotspots. There's even a legislative push in our own state for developing a statewide broadband access, which is really great for expanding schools like mine, which have always been 100% online. Nationwide, we're seeing some crazy ideas being explored because we know so much hangs in the balance of getting schools reopened. With 13,000 plus school districts across the US now having to navigate reopening plans without any centralized mandate or national level coordination, go figure, it opens the door for lots of innovation. If only we have the will to pursue it and drop the expectation of public education life going back to normal. Collectively, we see that finding a way to safely reopen schools is the linchpin. It's a must for reopening our economy. So we should all be invested in finding innovative solutions. We will certainly struggle to solve this problem to meet this crisis. Poverty, access, equality, it's all complex. And I don't mean to remotely indicate that free and public education can combat it on its own, but it's the tool I own. Education can be a great equalizer, and I am determined to wield this tool that I have as a teacher on behalf of not just my students, 
but for all of us. Interestingly enough, I came across this wonderful quote in this Thursday's UUCS Happenings. If you've not read the interview published by Hub City Writers Project between Scott Neely and Natalia Swanson of Alianza Spartanburg, I encourage you to give it a read. In it, Natalia points out that she draws hope in her own work from the glimmers of light that things can change and do change. She says, quote, I love the way John A. Powell, a UC Berkeley professor, describes change. Fissures are beginning to appear in the system. And when cracks start to show, we have to keep on hammering. When I see these small winds, Natalia says, the cracks, it gives me hope to keep hammering. Teaching is merely the tool I have in my tool chest to do something more meaningful and much farther reaching than information about the periodic table could ever go. I don't just teach chemistry. I combat poverty. Education is my hammer. A person isn't a job title. And it's not just those of us who have the title of teacher who can join in this work. We all have hammers. Education can be a shared passion and it's not limited to a physical classroom. Passion isn't something that we have to earn a paycheck for to be invested. We can all wield our own given hammers using our giftedness to engage bursting those cracks wide open to let the light in. If you've never seen the movie In Her Shoes, it's a 2005 film starring Tony Collette and Cameron Diaz, I highly recommend it. The story has great parallels to several things we've hit on this morning. It's the story of sisters fraught with sibling rivalry, one of whom is dyslexic and struggles to care for herself because of the impact of her learning disability. The movie captures this whole talk this morning in a single scene. There's a scene where Cameron Diaz, the dyslexic sister, is working in a nursing home. She sits on the bed with a now blind professor and she reads a poem to him. It's painful, it's labored reading. And he's so patient with her. He won't let her quit. He sees a crack and he gets out his hammer and he goes to work. He gets her to really think about what she read. He asks her questions, pushes her and encourages her along the way. That scene is what education should look like. It's investing in another person's future and in their personal growth. It's being present and noticing the cracks and even being willing to step in with your own hammer. And it can be so surprising and rewarding. The expression on Cameron Diaz's face when we see her after she's been told, likely for the first time in her life, that she's a smart girl. Man, if that doesn't make you cry, I don't know if we can be friends. It's the small wins, isn't it? They accumulate bit by bit, crack by crack. They create change and let more light in. It's our response to the crisis that matters. The Peabody sisters knew it, and I hope we do too. You who are on the road must have a code that you can live by and so become yourself because the past is just a goodbye. Teach your children well, 
their father's hell did slowly go by and feed them on your dreams the one they picks the one you'll know by don't you ever ask them why if they told you you would cry so just look at them and sigh and know they love you and know they love you the perilous time for the most highly gifted is not youth. The holy sensibilities of genius, for all the sensibilities of genius are holy, keep their possessor essentially unhurt as long as animal spirits and the idea of being young last. But the perilous season is middle age, when a false wisdom tempts them to doubt the divine origin of their dreams of their youth. When the world comes to them, not with the song of the siren against which all books warn us, but as a wise old man counseling acquiescence in what is below them. Elizabeth Palmer Peabody. You can choose to see the cracks, to let that be all you see. But I choose to see the light that is piercing through. Get your hammer, get ready, and join me. Let's see just how much change we can do together. We have spent time together and these holy moments give us strength to go down the windy road until we meet again. We have spent time together and these holy moments give us strength to go down the windy road until we meet again.